33 of the fastest cars and drivers in the world line up along the pit wall, waiting for the signal which will send them out to the starting line for the 500-mile classic. This is the biggest of all races with the biggest of all crowds. More than 175,000 fans fill every vantage point around the two and a half mile oval. All eyes are on the pits as last minute tune-ups are made before the challenge of courage, speed, and endurance. As time runs out, the Purdue University Band entertains in traditional ceremonies on the main straightaway. <laughs> Behind the flags and excitement of race day, there are many other stories. streamlined metal down a straightaway at 180 miles an hour and then crowd into the groove with 32 other thunderbolts. Each car, as it is wheeled out, carries the hopes and memories of months of work and planning. The mechanic's job is done and the drivers take over. Flying Jack McGrath in number three is his own chief mechanic. When it doesn't go, he says, he stands on it a little harder. There's no one to blame but himself. But he remembers when it did go, like a bomb. It's two weeks before the race. McGrath ready to qualify. Vukovic has set the track ablaze with new one lap and four lap records. Now with these records only three hours old, McGrath cranked up and got away on a warm up lap. The green flag pointed at McGrath, screaming out of the north turn. He was on it rocketing through the first turn faster than any man in Speedway history. One lap completed, a new record of 143.79 miles an hour. Watching his records crumble, Bill Vukovic. Coming up to the checkered flag and a new four lap record, 142.58 for the 10 mile run. Driver, mechanic, the fastest of them all, 500 miles to go. To the line, big number one, a new machine for Jimmy Bryan, national big car champion. Bryan finished second here last year. He drove a car with broken shock absorbers, broken front springs, but unbroken determination. For 130 laps, he went wheel to wheel with Vukovic until Vuki grabbed the winning margin as Brian was forced to pit for the third time. Pounded black and blue by his disabled car, Jimmy collapsed after the race. Brian takes his luck as it comes. This year, a new car can make the difference. Bill Vukovic, the man to beat now, came to the Speedway as midget champion to prove himself in the big cars. He came with the first Roadster, a new design, built especially for Indianapolis racing. He rolled to the line, an unknown driver in an unknown car. But steering failure sent Vukovic against the wall, nine laps from victory. He became the man to watch. And watch they did, as Vuki raced a thousand miles without relief to win twice in a row. Only two other Speedway Immortals, Wilbur Shaw and Maury Rose, have accomplished the same feat. Vukovic, biggest money winner in Indianapolis history and holder of more records, trying now for the record no one has. Three wins, back to back. Other veterans here today have helmets full of Indianapolis memories. Former national champion Tony Bettenhausen knows what it means to take the wheel here on the bricks. Tony in a qualifying run three years ago. He was on his way to break the record in number 99 and ran into real trouble. Another car, another year. Out of the north turn, into the home stretch, tail first. And 
another 500, this time with the temperature breaking records. Heat exhaustion forced him out of the race. Ready now for 200 more grueling laps. Number 39 moves up. Its pilot, rookie Johnny Boyd. His freshman year at the Speedway, but he piled up some memories in a hurry during practice runs. The uh, spin wasn't too bad, and it wasn't as long as some of them I've seen around here, except that the wall looked like the side of a 10-story building. Pat Flaherty, remembering the heat of 1953, he was cutting a wide path through the blazing afternoon until... I did realize what happened up there. I don't think I can figure the heat might have got me a little punchy. I wasn't tired, but uh, when I woke up in the hospital, I asked them uh, what happened. They said, you crashed. I said, well, fix the car. Let's get going again. Here is number 33, a new streamliner with Jim Raffman, the jockey. Jim was driving relief for Sam Hanks last year. Shaft locked up, and uh, that automatically locks your rear wheels up, and then uh, only the good Lord can take care of you from then on. The drivers climb into the cockpits. Tense rookies like Shorty Templeman. Seasoned veterans like Johnny Parsons, 1950 winner. The driver with one leg, Cal Nyday, fourth fastest qualifier. Art Cross, Walt Faulkner, rookie Al Herman, Jimmy Davies, fifth fastest in the field, Bob Swikert, who makes his home in the shadow of the speedway. The balloons drift away, a breathless moment. Then, gentlemen, start your engines. The waiting is over. of the mightiest men and machines of the racing world, the fastest field ever to compete at Indianapolis, move away behind the pace car. They must go once around in parade formation, the fury of their engines in check until they make a full circuit. Moving smoothly, Jerry Hoyt at the pole position, inside front row. Bettenhausen next to him and McGrath on the outside. In the second row, all eyes on Vukovic in the center. Hanks next to him on the outside. Through the second turn, heading for the long back stretch. Now under the bridge, and the pace quickens as the pack moves up the back stretch. short straightaway between the third and the fourth turn. And here they come. The most beautiful sight in all racing. 12,000 horsepower wheeling through the fourth turn and heading into the main straightaway and the green flag. Side and dives into the turn first. Bettenhausen roars after him. Hoyt drops to third. Agabasian is fourth. Vukovic is fifth. Safely through tornado turn and into the second. Listen to these engines sing. McGrath streaking away. Vukovic is now fourth, coming out of the backstretch. Closes in on 
Hoyt at the end of lap one. And he passes Hoyt to take third place. In the lap two, McGrath tries to fatten his lead as Vukovich fights Bettenhausen for second place. The crowd comes to its feet watching Vukovich make his move. Up the back stretch, Vukovich passing, moving into second place. Bettenhausen now third. Vukovich racing to a showdown with McGrath. moves smoothly as ever, showing his tailpipe to the field. McGrath, ten and a half seconds behind, his car fouled with exhaust fumes. Jerry Hoyt heads for the pit. Oil pump failure, and he's out of the race. His uniform is spattered with oil, but none left in the engine. Tough luck for this 26-year-old pole position winner. He tells this sad story to Jimmy Reese, the first man out of the race. There's nothing left of Jerry's victory hopes but an oily spot on the apron. McGrath's engine is still giving him trouble. Bob Schweikert's crew signaled the end of 125 miles, a quarter of the race. Schweikert in fourth position leads Brian by a split second. McGrath comes into the pits after 135 miles. Vukovic has moved away to a 17 second lead before McGrath pitted. Schweikert and Bryan flash by as McGrath's crew change wheels. McGrath is leaving his car. Jack is his own chief mechanic, the only driver mechanic in the race, and he's calling for a wrench. They say in the pits, if you raise the hood, you might as well give it up. But sometimes you keep trying. With McGrath in the pits, Brian charges into second place. McGrath is through. 
Magneto failure sends him to the garage. Lap 56. Vukovic is flying. He's lapped some cars five times and is running through the field with magnificent skill. Roger Ward spins on the backstretch. The way clear, Boyd and Vukovic move right along, but Al Keller spins into them from the inside. Vukovic is thrown over the rail, flipping helplessly. From a point directly opposite the bridge, the incident looked like this. Boyd's car, number 39, is thrown on its back and skids to a stop. Boyd is trapped underneath. Keller, in the car that started it all, waves frantically to warn other drivers. Ed Elysian, a close friend of Vukovic, stops his car and risks his life, crossing the track to go to Vuki's aid. Keller rushes to Boyd, trapped under his car, still in the path of the other drivers. Vuki's car, a blazing and battered wreck. Keller and Speedway guards roll Boyd's car upright. Miraculously, Boyd has only friction burn from skidding on his back with his car on top of him. A mile away in the pits, McGrath senses something. All cars are slowed down by the caution light. Tony Bettenhausen heads for the pits. Buki's crew on the pit wall search anxiously for their man. Cal Nye Day pits as Buki's crew waits. Jim Bryan pits. He was running second behind Vukovic. Vukovic is now long overdue. Paul Russo takes over in Bettenhausen's car. These two men had a relief driver agreement to share the ride. White-faced Tony Bettenhausen passes the news of what he has seen on the backstretch. Then the announcement. Vukovic, two-time winner of the 500, has suffered fatal injuries in the four-car crash. Jimmy Bryan, now in first place, rolls onto the track under caution signal. The track is clear. After 16 caution laps, the green flag flies again. Bryan in the lead. Bob Swigert only five seconds behind. Brian suddenly begins to lose power, and the field moves in on him. Brian is passed in the first turns by a straggler, and Brian's chief mechanic, Clint Browner, asks, what's wrong? Brian is trailing smoke. Out of the north turn, Jimmy Davis in car number 15 bears down and passes. Schweikert right behind. Down the stretch. And now Schweikert takes the lead. On the next lap, Schweikert is alone. Where's Brian? Jimmy slows down to pit. His exhaust port's covered with smoke. It looks like the national champion is through. Fuel pump trouble and a broken magneto drive gear. Brian is definitely out. And is he mad? Schweikert's crew watch as he pounds out the last lap. Cal Day moving through the fourth turn. His front axle snaps. He slams into the wall, then rolls across the track to the infield. Nide is hurt, and his car, which was fifth at 425 miles, is washed out. On the green signal, they're moving again. But Don Freeland, in number 12, heads for the pits. Freeland is Schweikert's last major threat, and he's out of the race, leaving only 14 of the 33 starters still racing. 50 miles to go, and Schweikert's crew isn't through worrying. With a lead of less than a minute and a half, they don't want another pit stop. But Schweikert is running low on fuel. Is he using his reserve tank yet? 
The Bardal crew check the time of their car, now running third. Swikert's timer sweats it out. Bob has eased off the throttle to save fuel. Dinosaur leads the trophy to victory lane. But Swikert's worries aren't over. He's down to the last few gallons, and Jimmy Davies in the Bardal special is ready to move if Swikert fails. Where is he? Does he have fuel to make it? The crowd comes to its feet. to go, there's the white flag. Tony Bettenhausen in second place gets the white flag. The last lap. The checkered flag for Bob Schweiker. The waiting, hoping, sweating is over for the mechanics. The fellow in the dark coat going wild is car owner John Zink. A big pat on the back goes to his chief mechanic. On to the winner's circle. The mechanical masterminds who prepared Schweikert's car, including his car owner, a man who paid $30,000 for a roadster just to have the privilege of changing a tire. Here he is. 500 miles in 3 hours, 53 minutes. Schweikert led for 85 laps, or a total of 212 and a half miles. And he wins $76,000 for his skill, a share of the record-breaking purse of $270,000. Schweikert gets a victory kiss from Dinah Shore and from his wife, Dolores, to end an unforgettable 500.